story for you. The Killer Clown of Wellington. Yep, we're going back to Florida. <laughs> you can always count on Florida for a really good trial. The, the Florida, Idaho, Waukesha, <laughs> Wisconsin. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we're going to Florida. Wellington, Florida. Now, let me tell you a little about, bit about Wellington, Florida. Wellington, is a very affluent neighborhood. It is uh, right before you get to the Everglades, west of Palm Beach. It is in Palm Beach County, but these homes that are there are anywhere from one to five million dollar homes. The neighborhood that Marlene Warren lived in at the time of the murders was called Arrow Cove. And Arrow Cove, each house has their own private landing strip. Yeah, so how did Marlene Warren get there? Let's talk a little bit about that. On May 26, 1990, Marlene Warren is having breakfast with her son, Joe, and some of his friends. Now, Joe had been in a car accident and was home recovering, and his friends were visiting with him. She gets a knock on the door. She goes to answer the door. There's a clown there wearing a pink and yellow clown suit an orange wig, and a big red nose. White makeup. The clown is holding a bouquet of flowers and some foil balloons. And she says, oh, how pretty. This is what Joe hears her say. As the clown proceeds to pull out a gun and shoots her directly in the head, in the face. Marlene collapses in the floor of the doorway, front doorway. Joe runs as soon as he hears the gun. He sees the clown making their way to a vehicle, a Chrysler convertible. The clown looks back at Joe. He sees big brown eyes. He runs to go get into his vehicle and tries to follow the clown while his friends call 911 to get help for his mother. He was unable to stay behind the clown and could, could not catch up to it. So the clown has never seen again. So let me tell you a little bit about Marlene. Marlene Warren was a, born April 15th, 1950. If she was still living, she'd be 72 years old. She was one of three children. She was the middle child. Her sisters are Deborah and Leanne. Her family moved around frequently, and at 15 years of age, Marlene met and married a man named John Aaron. Um, she became pregnant with her son, John Jr., and later in the marriage had her second son, Joey. Now, they were living happily ever after until John, who was away on business, gets into a car accident and dies. Now, at this point, Marlene is 22 years old with two young boys, toddlers, um, and is on her own. Not long after that, she meets a man named Michael Warren. They fall in love. They get married in 1972. They are living up in the Detroit, Michigan area in a suburb of Detroit, and they decide we're going to move to Florida. What a great idea. Um, <laughs> We're going to move to Florida, Palm Beach, Florida, because the schools will be better than the ones in Detroit and the crime rate would be half what it was in the Detroit suburbs. So they go ahead and they move down to Palm Beach, Florida. What they did was they started flipping houses. They would buy a house, stay in it long enough to make a profit, sell it, buy another one, and they just kept doing this. As their profits, as their capital started building up, they started building rental properties to the point where at the time of the murders, she was managing 17 rental properties that they had built and maintained. During the 1970s, Michael started a business called Bargain Motors. It was actually two businesses. One was a car rental business. The other one was where he sold used cars. Um, during the early 1970s, shortly after he started the business, he was 
put on probation for 18 months when he was found guilty of tampering with the odometer. He had sold a vehicle and had rolled the, the odometer back to 25000 And when the guy tried to get a title on the vehicle, he found out that the actual mileage was more like 50000 So, yeah, he didn't get away with that one. So their, their capital continued to rise, and they were able to finally build their dream home in this Aero Co. community out in Wellington. 6,500 square foot home. I don't want to be the person that has to clean that house. 6,500 square feet. Oh, my. Okay. Um, shortly after they moved to Palm Beach County, uh, all was not uh, well. John Jr. gets into a car accident when he is 22 years old and he perishes. Very hauntingly like his father. So, so terrible. So in 1990, Michael Warren, he decides he's going to expand Bargain Motors to a different lot, larger lot. Um, he hires several repo men. And what he his business is, is he basically will sell a car to anybody. He doesn't care what your credit is. You come and go over to Bargain Motors, you can purchase a vehicle. But if you miss a payment, you are getting repossessed. One of the repo companies that he hired was owned by a man named Richard Keene. Now, Richard Keene brought his wife, Sheila Keene, to the property, to the Bargain Motors, where they would meet and discuss what he was able to do with his company. Now, who was Sheila Keene? Sheila Keene was raised in LaBelle, Florida. It's a very rural area, very rural. Um, she met and married Richard, who was much, much older than her. She had long, dark hair, wide brown eyes, was, was described by many people as stunningly beautiful. She was described as outspoken, defiant, and fearless. She and Richard owned, they both drove these big old trucks where they would just go out and repo for all these different businesses that would hire them. She would go into the worst neighborhoods and just repossess vehicles. I wouldn't do that. So at the time she met Richard, her cousin had been dating Richard and she actually stole Richard from her cousin. He was 20 years older than her and was former director of the United Clan of America, which is the Southern chapter of the KKK. He later goes to jail when he is caught on a runway, an air runway, trafficking marijuana and gets into a shootout with police. So he, after that, he served four years in prison where they had to keep moving him around because of his association with the KKK. He was like prime meat at the prison. During the time that he was in prison, Sheila supported. She moved up near where the jail was. She'd make money by selling things that she had found. And when he got out, that's when they started their repo business. They had a son named Charles in 1987. He does not come into play here. You don't hear anything else about Charles in any of my research of this case. Sheila Keen, at the time she becomes involved with the business relationship with Bargain Motors, is 26 years old. Now, she keeps hanging around Bargain Motors to the point where now Michael is taking an interest in her. He actually hires her to work for him exclusively. So she is now his repo person. Soon after she starts working with Bargain Motors, she and Michael Warren develop a very close relationship. After that, Sheila and Richard start having marital problems. She took out a restraining order on him when she said he beat her up and threw her out somewhere, abandoned her somewhere in Indian Town. Now, Indian Town is like the middle of nowhere. So she said that was the last straw and she divorced him. She moved into an apartment building and people around the apartment building thought that she and Michael Warren were married. He saw her, they saw her there so often with him. He would come, he would go that they thought 
oh, that must be her husband. And it's rumored that he was paying for the apartment building. He was paying her rent. They were seen out so often. They were dining together. They would go to the racetracks together. This is one of the interests that Michael Keane had. He, at one point, he bought a race horse and that didn't work out, but he loved to go to the races. races. In fact, on May 26, 1990, at the time of the murders, he was on his way to Calder Racetrack to watch a horse race. Now, fast forward to the day of the murders. Within two hours of the murders, police get an anonymous tip that says, you know, you should probably talk to Michael and Sheila. Interesting, huh? Now, Michael was already on their radar. Usually the husband always is. Following the shooting, 911 was called. The EMS comes out. They take her to Palms West Hospital. She's in critical condition. She lives for two days on life support, at which point the doctors tell Marlene's mother, listen, she has no brain activity. What do you want to do? And she said, you know, pull the plug. So they took her off of life support and she passed away. Police began their investigation. They conducted dozens of interviews and all of the reports that they were received were consistent that Michael and Sheila were having an affair. Of course, they were interviewed and both denied having an affair. Now, Marlene reportedly had told her mom that she suspected Michael was having an affair and that if anything happened to her, they should look at Michael. Does that sound familiar? We've had a case like that recently, yeah. Now, Michael had every reason not to want his wife around. She had, he, he had a five-figure insurance policy on her life. Everything that they owned was in her name, including his car dealerships, his rental business, all of the 17 rental properties, and their home in Wellington. All of it was in her name. And two weeks following the murder, Marlene had shed a, set up an appointment with a real estate agent because she wanted to get rid of those rental properties. She had had enough. She did not want to manage these things anymore. Now, Joe, her son, had been helping her manage those properties, but she had just, she had had enough. She didn't want to do it anymore. Interesting. So police also get a call from a woman who worked for Spotlight Costumes. And she said, listen, I sold a clown costume to a woman that matches the description of the one you're looking for. So they go over and they interview her and she actually looked at a photo lineup and identified Sheila as the person that purchased the clown costume. Who She asked for, do you have any extra white makeup? So she, cause she wanted to put the white makeup on her face. By the way, the weapon and the costume were never found, nor were there ever any fingerprints found on anything. And then back in that day, DNA was not a big thing. Uh, we're talking 1990. It had only been around since 1985, DNA, and really was not very well trusted in courts. And it was only three years prior to the murders that anyone had even used DNA to get a conviction in the whole country of the United States. It just was not fully understood by anybody, including the public, including people that would be on a jury. They just didn't understand it. So the other thing that they did was try to identify where did these balloons and flowers come from? And they figured out that the only place that sold this arrangement of balloons and flowers was a Publix supermarket that happened to be a mile away from Sheila's apartment building. Two workers at the Publix supermarket said that they, uh, a woman had come in around 9.30. She had purchased the bouquet and the flowers and they were able to identify her in a photo lineup. Now, on May 30th, four days after the murders, they find a Chrysler LeBaron abandoned in the Winn-Dixie parking lot, and it matches the description that Joe gave, color, make, model, of the vehicle that the clown was driving after the murder of his mother. Police discovered that on April 13th, this car had been reported missing from the Payless car rental lot. A employee named Claude was interviewed and he described a phone call that Michael Warren got. 
and there were several witnesses to this phone call from a couple who were driving this Chrysler LeBaron. They had rented it from Payless Rental, and they were calling to see if they could return the rental. Now, at this point in time, Bargain Motors was using the term pay less in their ads. Payless Rental Car Company later sued them and won, and they had to take that out of the ad. But it was confusing to a lot of people. So this this older couple, they saw that it said pay less, so they called Bargain Motors, said, how can we return the vehicle? Michael tells this couple, just drive it into the, you know, drive it to the lot, leave it there, and put the keys in the, in the visor, and I'll take care of the rest. So Michael then has this guy, Claude, this employee, Claude, drive him and Sheila over to the Payless car rental lot, where Michael proceeds to get into the Chrysler LeBaron and drive off with it. Interesting. Now, the police scoured this vehicle. They sent out the crime scene unit. They wanted to see what they could find. They found some orange fibers on the uh, below a floor mat in the vehicle. They found some brown hair in the vehicle. They, they were then able to search Sheila's apartment and they found some brown hairs there. So they had something to compare the brown hairs to later on. Not then, because CNA wasn't there, but they found some brown hairs. And what they did say that it was a similar shade to the ones that were found in the vehicle. She was interviewed again, and she vehemently denied ever having been in a Chrysler LeBaron, anything to do with the murder, wearing a clown. It wasn't me. I didn't, I didn't go to public supermarket. I didn't purchase flowers and balloons. It wasn't me. What they also found was a pair of shoes, because the witnesses to the clown, Joey and his friends, had said, the clown wasn't wearing clown shoes. She was wearing black lace-up shoes or boots. So they found two pairs of black lace-up shoes in Sheila's apartment. One of those pairs had orange fibers in the sole of the shoe. Maybe matching the wig, right? So after a three-year-long investigation, they turn it all over to prosecutors and the prosecutors say, listen, this is all circumstantial and we don't believe this evidence is going to hold up in front of a jury. We're not, we're not going to file charges on this woman. So everything gets boxed, put in a box, put on a shelf for two decades, two decades. Now, what happened during those two decades? Well, Michael and Sheila go to Las Vegas and they get married. Yes, they get married. They then move to Abington, Virginia, where they start a business called the Purple Cow. It was a drive through hamburger joint. And they put everything they have into this Purple Cow. They, they work night and day and they finally, um, you know, they're living in Abington, Virginia in the Blue Ridge Mountains in this beautiful home and they finally sell the purple cow and decide that they're going to retire. Now neighbors describe them as just very loving, friendly, you know, happy couple, you know, clearly very in love with each other. Sheila for 15 years was using an I alias calling herself Debbie Warren. They were on their way home from visiting a friend and they are pulled over by police and she is arrested. Now, how did that happen? Well, let me tell you. The case, the cold case was re-examined in 2000 and then again in 2012. And both times, investigators thought that they could help, they could go after Sheila, but they did not have the resources to reinvestigate this case. In 2014, they applied for a grant and received $125,000 from the federal government to reopen Marley and Warren's case. At that point, they're able to set up a task force that included the FBI. So they spent the next four years researching the evidence, looking at the DNA, 
hunting for new leads, reinvestigating, re-interviewing. You know, they had to locate people. They just started from scratch and conducted this whole investigation. What the DNA showed that was sent off was that the orange fibers from the balloons, from the shoes, and from the Chrysler were all from the same source. Yeah, so that ties Sheila to the vehicle and the murders. They also found hair from Sheila that was tied in the, um, you know, the ribbons, the strings from the balloon. They found some of her hair in there. They were able to match that from hair in her apartment from the DNA. So they had a warrant out for her arrest. The prosecutors at that point said, yep, we've got enough, go get her. So the couple is pulled over, she is arrested. When she is arrested, she says to the police, aren't you gonna arrest Michael? And they're like, no. Michael never got arrested, never gets arrested. Nope. To this day, never arrested. Now there was a person, a defense attorney that had represented their son, Joe, and when he got into some trouble and he, he got Joe off, you know, Joe was facing, he was in big trouble, but he got Joe off. He got him with six months probation. And as they're leaving the courtroom, he says, Michael asked him, you know, what would happen, you know, what, what would happen if a man wanted to murder his wife? You know, is there a way he could get away with it? And the guy jokingly told him, well, he could, he could have somebody dress up as a clown and kill her, maybe get away with it then. Just saying, how haunting is that? Yep. So, Sheila's arrested. She's extradited from Abington, Virginia to Palm Beach County, and she is put in jail there. Now, her case was set for trial in 2020. The prosecutors announced we are no longer seeking the death penalty. And then in April of 2021, while they're still waiting for this to go to trial, everything went on hold from the pandemic after that. And she was facing the death penalty in Florida because she, of the use of the weapon. So nothing's happening during the pandemic. She's sitting in jail. Finally, in April of 2021, her attorneys, because she did not have a bond, she was denied bond. They moved to have her get assigned a bond and the a hearing is held before the judge. What they said was, first of all, this evidence, uh, there's no real evidence that she actually committed this crime, which that's ridiculous. And then they talked more about the procedures for COVID in the jail, that they were lacking proper procedures and that she was at really high risk. So she, she deserves a bond. So on April 29th, the judge denied the bond. He said, first of all, because of the circumstances of this case, because of the strength of the evidence uh, and the availability of her financial situation where she could, she has all these money she has access to, she could flee. Nope, no bond. In September 2021, the trial was supposed to occur, but the defense counsel asked for a continuance, citing uh, their ability to review a lot of the evidence. It was very, very difficult because the case was so old. They were having to transfer files from recordings to digital, and there was a lot of things going on. And the judge said, okay. So then he sets it for March 21st, 2022. Now, I don't know why it got continued after that, but there was some problems with discovery, motions to compel, things like that. Um, so it finally, it is now set for May 12th and Long Crime and Court TV will be covering that live. So I will be recapping this trial live for you. Now, a couple of things have come to light during the last few years where, while she has been incarcerated, there was a guy named Edward Barr, an inmate up in Maine, who claimed that Michael Warren hired him to kill his wife. Now, I don't know if this is total BS or not, or if that's gonna come into this trial. I think there's been motions filed regarding that um, that have not been ruled on. The other issue is cross-contamination of the evidence. The defense and the prosecution cannot deny this. If you look at those bags of evidence from 
33 years ago. They're ripped, they're unsealed, they're in horrific condition, you know, because they were probably just stuffed in a box somewhere for, you know, 32 years. And so the defense is arguing that the fibers and the hair, all of that could have been cross-contaminated and not, not belong to his client. So there's some rulings on that that are uh, the court is waiting for, or that the attorneys are waiting for from the court. So coming up will be that trial on May 12th, the killer clown of Wellington. Yeah. And Michael never gets charged. Nope. Now, he claims that prior to the murders, shortly before the murders, he was kind of pulling away from Sheila. He felt like she was becoming, she was injecting herself too much into his life. And, you know, he was trying to break it off with her, but I'm not buying it, given that he elopes with her after the murder. <laughs> they get married and live happily ever after. Yeah. Let me see if I missed anything. Hmm. Nope. That's it. That's everything. That's all my notes. So there's been a lot of coverage of this over the years. You know, different podcasts, different, uh, you know, 60 Minutes Dateline, that whole thing. But yeah, it's finally going to be going to trial in May. I don't think there'll be any more continuances. So that's the show for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the content. Don't forget to hit that like button. I'll see you in the next video.